Hello everyone, welcome to Random Bits and Pieces from My Brain. Today we're gonna start a brand new Let's Play for Brigandzine Grand Edition. Brigandzine is one of my favorite games of all times. Actually, it's in my top five. Um, and we're gonna go ahead and start playing that. Now, Brigandzine, what is that game? Uh, really, it's a strategy RPG where the goal of the game is to capture all of the castles uh, using your army of monsters and knights and after you do that there's a plot twist that happens that we're gonna see eventually um, so you choose your nation you have knights you have monsters and you build an army and the goal of the game like I said is to unify the land um, it's kind of a a little bit of a unique type of game uh, there's a few other games that might resemble that uh, i think about for example dragon force uh, maybe a little bit of master of monsters in there uh, maybe a hint of ogre battle as well but it, it there's not a lot of games like this and i think its uniqueness is really what drew me to that game for so long uh, back in the day uh, we got Brienzing legion of forcina um, which is not exactly the same game as this. This is Grand Edition, which never was released outside of, the, of Japan. So obviously right now I'm playing a, a patch made by fans. Um, there's a lot of differences between the games. The biggest one, and as you can see on the screen now, probably the biggest difference between Legion of Forcina and Grand Edition is that there's a multiplayer mode in Grand Edition. Obviously, I'm by myself, so I'm not going to be playing that. I'm going to play the story, and we're going to see if we can uh, unify the LAN. Now, this game is one of the very few games where I'm actually really good at. So, the random pieces that I am adding to this game are going to be to make the game more challenging, and I'm going to get to that in just a little bit here. So we're going to go ahead and select the country that we want to start with. Uh, I'm going to select King as the difficulty, that's the highest difficulty of the game. And I think that most fans of the game are going to agree with me that as awesome as this game is, the AI is maybe a little bit lacking. And once you've played that game for quite a bit, um, the game becomes kind of easy so that's why I'm going to put some restrictions on myself uh, that are going to be mostly random uh, and hopefully that's going to add a good challenge to the game so we're going to set a king and now we're gonna see a little bit of an overview of all of the lands that we can select so here we have New Almikia uh, which is ruled by Prince Lan. So the way that the story starts is there's a coup uh, and I'm not spoiling anything because we're gonna see that here in just a second but um, there's a coup and uh, Prince Lance is from the former kingdom uh, that just fell so he's going to be trying to reunify the land under the name of his old country. Then we have uh, Norgard, which is basically kind of northern barbarian type, uh, very focused on combat and everything. Uh, it's led by Vaynard. Uh, completely to the east, we have Leonia, which is ruled by Leonis. That's going to be the country that I am going to select. Um, a lot of people tend to say that it's one of the hardest countries to use because their high level knights to start are not all that strong and the knights that are going to get strong start at a very low level uh, also there's not a lot of really good monsters to get at the start so it makes it a little bit challenging uh, but that's always that's one of the lands that i use the most uh, here to the southeast we have Iscalio with uh, Dreist as the the ruler, the mad tyrant. Uh, he's pretty strong. Uh, he likes to rule his country as Yudar Chaos. Um, pretty, a pretty strong one. 
I'm gonna skip that one for now. Now we have Carleon, uh, led by Kai, which is a king uh, and also a magician. He's a really strong magician. Um, and he, uh, he always makes a, an alliance with New Elmiki at the start of the game, uh, which means that they're not going to attack each other. And then finally, the one that I skipped is Isgaris with Zemeckis, which is the one who uh, staged the coup. Um, really strong general that basically thinks that he can unify the land using sheer power. Um, if you play as Esgaris, it's one of the hardest countries to use. Yes, they do start with a lot of really strong knights, but they, they're in the middle. They have a lot of uh, fronts to cover at once, and it's extremely hard for them to get extra knights to help defend them. Uh, so we're going to get into that in just a little bit about how you can get more knights. So I'm going to go ahead and select Leonia, which is the country we're going to be using. And yes, this is my path. So there's going to be a little bit of the story at first, where I'm going to read through that. So what we see now is basically the overworld map uh, with all the different castles that we have to conquer to unify the land and try and win the game. And no, I do not have a patch for English voiceovers. I tend to prefer the Japanese ones anyway in any game that I play. So the castle is in flames. All right, and uh, the coup was staged, and a battle ensued, and ensure, and then we are now in our capital in Leonia. So our story starts now. So to the right there is Leonis, that's going to be our ruler. And the guy with her is Kilof, which is her childhood friend and protector. They both start at pretty low level, but they can become really strong. Actually, there's been a lot of um, arguing over the years in different brigands and forums about who is the strongest knight in the game, and some people say Kilaf is. I'm not going to get into that. Uh, let's just say he's probably in the top five for sure. I think pretty much everybody would agree with that. <clears throat> Pardon. Oh, uh, what's up? Is something wrong, Bishop Paternus? I'm afraid so. Everyone is gathered in the Great Hall. We must join them. In the Great Hall. News has come. General Zemeckis rebelled and overthrew Almikia. In its place, he has formed the Esgaris Empire and declared himself Emperor. Oh dear, a country as old and powerful as Almikia overthrown so easily? I expect war is inevitable. Almikia's fall leaves a power vacuum that will ignite the hearts of the ambitions across Forsina. Surely Leonia will not get caught up in this. Don't worry, 
If you look worried, everyone in Leonia will panic. Yes, sometimes Kilov gives good advice. What do you mean, sometimes? So in the story, Kilov and Asmit are often at odds. They don't see eye to eye about how to help defend the country, so... Anyway, it will be difficult to avoid this conflict. I recommend you order the knights to ready the defenses immediately. Yes. I don't know if I'm up to this. Alright, so the way this game works is each month you have two phases. So you, you get one turn every month and each turn is separated into two phases. The first phase is the organized phase. That's where you get to move your troops around, uh, you can hire more monsters, you can send your knights on quests, um, you can equip new items that you found, uh, you can class change your knights, promote your monsters, all that kind of good stuff. This is a this is the bulk of how you're going to set up your army so that you can actually win some battles. After you, you set an organized phase uh, is the battle phase. So that's where you can attack to invade uh, the other countries. A knight that just moved that particular turn cannot attack that turn but it can defend so if you move a knight so if I was to move a knight over here next turn I wouldn't be able to attack up here with that knight but if over here they decide to attack me down here then I get to be able to defend with that knight so that's strategy to uh, to remember here um, I'm gonna go ahead and go over all of the characters that we start with and then I'm going to, after that, explain what are going to be my restrictions for playing the game uh, so that we um, can see that, or so that I can maybe raise the challenge a little bit. So we're going to start here in Damas. Alright, so we can see, uh, if I click on it, we can see Damas Castle. I have three knights over there and seven creatures. So the way that it works is that each country has a certain amount of knights. The knights are basically your generals, and each of them are going to have an army of monsters with them. Um, so if we go into organize here, we're gonna see a little bit how it looks like. So here we have Isfus, and Isfus has a rock and two clay golems with him. Um, the numbers that you see on the right, 160 slash 233, is what's called rune power so each monster costs a certain amount of rune power to be able to be into that particular knight's army so for example the rock air is 70 so rune cost 70 you can see here so it takes 70 out of 233 if you look at Langborg at the bottom here, which is arguably one of the worst knights in the entire game, uh, he only has a grand total of 138, so you wouldn't even be able to have two rocks with him. Uh, obviously, stronger monsters cost a lot more, so a rock costs 70, a scorpion costs 20. Scorpions are usually not very strong. If you manage to get one to get pretty high level, um, they have pretty good defense, but they have really low HP and not a lot of attack power, and they are susceptible to spells, so it's really hard to get them up, so that's why they're not super expensive to equip or to have in your army. Um, if, if you go and attack or if you defend, basically if one of your knights fall in combat, they don't disappear, they don't die, uh, they're basically injured for a month. Uh, so for one month you're not going to be able to use them to attack or defend, they're going to be sent back to your capital and they're going to need to stay there for a month with, with no possibility to do anything. Your monsters, however, uh, if they die in combat, that's it, they can't come back. So if I lose uh, that rock here, uh, he's gone, he's not going to be coming back. So we're going to go ahead and go over 
I'm not gonna go over all of the monsters. Maybe I'm gonna go ahead over the and go over them as I play and give a little bit of an overview. But I am going to go over the different characters that we have. So one of the high level characters that Leonia starts with is Isfus. Isfus is a monk. Oops. All right, and he starts at level 16. So monks are. Uh, physical attackers with a little bit of magic, uh, healing magic mostly, uh, so they can hit uh, pretty good. They're, they don't have a really good defense, but they can dodge alright, and they can attack alright, and they can heal a little bit as well. Isfus is a pretty decent character. He has pretty decent rune power at 233. Alright, and what do they say about him? A smiling giant with gentle heart, he works under Cardinal Paternus and enjoys the simple things like gardening or feeding birds. He is like a big brother to kill off and would really put his life on the line for the queen. Alright, so we see his spells. He has Eel and Cleans, so basically a Eel to restore HP and Cleans uh, Eel's Poison and other negative effects. Next we have Sharni, which is a Lancer. Um, Sharni is also pretty strong. Um, Lancers uh, tend to have a pretty good attack and pretty good evasion. They have very limited spells. Uh, she usually grows up to be pretty good. Um, and uh, they also have a ranged attack with their javelin that they can use. So they're a little versatile. They're, they're pretty cool. So what they say about Charlene is her father had no son, so he raised her as a warrior. She is praised for her skills and very rational, ignoring feelings, but that can make her seem cruel and earn the nickname Ice Blossom. And then finally we have Langborg. Again, I mentioned it. He's arguably one of the worst knights in the in the game. Uh, Personally, he's the second worst. I think the worst knight in the game is Brossom with New Almechia. I think he's just horrendous. Uh, Langborg, at least, as far as sheer stats to fight and defense, he's at least average there. Uh, but he has horrible room power and he's extremely hard to use. Alright, so that's Langborg. He's a knight. Originally from Nargard, he left when Vaynard became king, saying, I could never follow a man of such small caliber. Now he calls himself the brains of Leonia, and annoys Leonis with constant nonsensical suggestions. Um, so, not only does he suck, but he thinks he's really good. So, those are the, type, the worst kind of people you can find. Alright, so that's the people we have in Damas. Uh, down here in Whistling, we're gonna have um, two knights. We're gonna have Philo and Sophia. So here they are. So they're two clerics, both are level seven. Um, although, through all of my playthroughs, Philo tends to get a little bit stronger than Sophia. They're both decent units. Uh, Philo just has a little bit of a better growth than uh, Sophia, even though they start at the same level. So they're both clerics, so basically healers. They they don't have a lot of uh, of attacks or anything going on for them at the start of the game. It makes it pretty hard to get them to level ten. Well, not hard, but you have to work for it to get them to level ten. At level ten, you get promotions where you can uh, get your units promoted and stronger. Whichever path you go, once they're level 10, it gets a lot easier to level them from there on. But at, at that low level, they basically have heals and a physical attack, and that's it. Alright, so pure and innocent, like a lone blossom on a moonlit shore. Her spirit is strong yet gentle. She soothes everyone around her and is Leonis's confident, always having an open ear. Then Sophia, same deal, she's a cleric, so same kind of limitations at the start. A beautiful, intelligent maiden, she can be a chatterbox, but her wisdom and bravery are highly valued. She studied under Solon the Wise together with her friend Phil. So they're both friends, uh, they're pretty useful, but uh, you have to take the time to build them, which is kind of a theme for 
Leonia because a lot of their knights start at a really low level. Uh, by the way, the max level is 30 in this game, so 7 is kind of low. Next, we're gonna go down here. So, when you see that uh, there's no flag uh, in the wind here, that means there's no knights there. And when you see the flag uh, move like that, that means there are people there. So now in Hadrian, we have two knights as well. So here we have Chantel, which is a pyromancer, which is basically a mage. And we have Raisin, which is a monk. We already talked about monks. So mages are really strong in this game because all of them get at least one AoE spell. And AoE spells can be devastating uh, with how quickly you can kill stuff. So Chantel starts again at a level, level 6. He is cool and reserved about everything except his infant son. Beaming with pride, he talks about him all the time, even to the queen, dreaming of his son's wonderful future. And then we have Raisin, which is another monk. He is nowhere near as strong as Isfus. He's still useful, but he has low room power, just 160, and uh, because of that he's a little bit harder to level up. Obsessed with training, he quietly keeps to himself unless challenging someone to a sparring match. He once killed a training partner, and so is disliked by his countrymen, though he has never tried to excuse his guilt and stands in battle to defend them. Alright. And now, finally, I, I kept the capital for last because it has basically the strongest knights in it. So we have four knights here. So we're gonna start with our ruler, Lianis. She starts at only level 3, that's really low, but she gets really strong. She becomes a really strong magic user and um, she's extremely useful because of that. So here's what they say about her. Once a common village girl, she was chosen as queen of the pious land of Leonia through prophecy. Quiet and gentle, her people admire how she bravely fulfills her duty. Kidoff is her friend since childhood. I already mentioned that. Now we have Kidoff, also starts at level 3, really low level, once again, if you take the time to level him up, he becomes one of the best units in the game. Alright, he's a Barbarian, those are more like just front row units. While then tempera temperamental, he is a lifelong friend to Lianes and became a knight to protect her. Though he often speaks sharply to her, his actions show he actually cares a great deal. Next we have the highest level knight that Leonia starts with, which is Paternus, level 20. He's a cardinal, so that's a priest on steroids. Uh, they have uh, AoE spells to heal and to hurt enemies. Paternus is a pretty good unit, not the strongest one you're gonna find, but he's uh, he's pretty decent. He's definitely at the start for Leonia, he's definitely the strongest one, although he's going to get surpassed eventually by uh, some of the lower level units when they level up. <coughs> Excuse me. Alright, so a warrior priest who fights beside Lianes, he watches over her and Kilaf like a father. Since Lianes is unfamiliar with bureaucracy, he handles governmental details for her. And finally we have Asmit, uh, which is a bishop, which is a priest with some attack spells and some healing capabilities. Can also attack a little bit, not, not too strong, not too weak. A wise leader in Leonia, he is known as a perfectionist who can be too rigid, but the queen trusts him fully. Kilov doesn't like that she relies on Esmet so often instead of it. Alright, so those are your starting knights when you start with Leonia. Um, through gameplay, you're gonna find more, and I'm going to explain a little bit of that as we play. 
Uh, now, before I stop the introduction video, I'm going to uh, explain what my limitations are going to be to make the game a little bit tougher. So, the first thing that I'm going to do is... And again, I, I kind of have to uh, put restrictions on myself uh, because, and I think I mentioned that already, the game, once you play the game a lot, the game can become pretty easy to abuse the AI. The, the AI is not that strong. Personally, that's probably the only real flaw of the game. So you kind of have to, and if you look online, uh, you're gonna see other people that have made challenges for themselves to make the game a little bit tougher. Uh, so I'm going to do things that I haven't seen any, uh, anybody else do. So the first thing that I'm going to do is instead of creating... So when, when you go and attack, you can bring up to three knights, so three armies basically with you. So instead of creating a couple different super strong units of threes and just level the, those up, which tends to be what makes the game too easy, Every turn, I'm going to randomly select my attack team. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to enter the names of all of my knights that I have available for that turn into a random generator online, and I'm going to shuffle the names. And the top three in the list are going to be... Uh, so for example, if I were to start now, the top three are going to, to be put in there, to defend that castle because this one here can attack me and then the next three knights are going to be put here and the rest are going to be sent on quests then i randomly choose which team is going to be my attack team so it's going to be either top or bottom the only exception to that is your ruler so for us it's going to be leonis leonis cannot go out on quest so basically i will hit the randomize button until Lianis, so in this case here, is going to be into the top six people, so that she's at least in, a, in one of the two there, since she cannot go on quest. That's the only exception. That means that sometimes I'm gonna have strong units go uh, to war, sometimes I'm going to be kind of weak, and I still have to attack every turn that I can attack. Once I do my attack, sometimes it's okay to retreat, but I have to make it a pretty good effort to try so at least to weaken them uh, sometimes I might get lucky and win regardless but I have to try and attack each turn once I've attacked uh, with that attack unit the next turn I'm going to roll again and basically get a different attack team that means that Langborg that we talked about who is really not a great knight uh, he might get used a lot and maybe not it's all going to be random uh, that's going to help me not build super teams because that's really what kills quote unquote the game is you build super teams and the, the computer just cannot keep up and then you basically end up just crushing everything. So we're not gonna we're not gonna be doing that. So it's gonna be randomly chosen. That's my first limitation. <clears throat> the second one is going to be that I will let the computer do defense. Again, <clears throat> the AI is not all that strong and if I defend, if I'm the one defending, I'm probably going to win 90% of the time. So to make it a little bit harder, I'm going to let the computer, so if, for example, if Ear, if Umber decides to attack Damas Ear and attack me, I'm going to put the defense on auto battle, like that it's weak AI against weak AI. I have two exceptions to that though. The first one, if the computer attacks my attack team, I am allowed to defend with them. So if, you know, if, the, if Damas was the attack team that was randomly selected for me, and and Humber comes and attacks me before before I have the time to attack them, then I'm allowed to do that defense. The other exception is if they attack the castle where my ruler is. So if they attack where Leonis is, I'm also allowed to make that defense. Those are the, the only two exceptions. And finally, 
the last restriction that I'm putting on myself. That one is not really random per se. Uh, but another way to kind of get overpowered in the game is to mess up with character progression and to make them super units that can, you know, have AoE spells and AoE heals and are strong attackers and everything. So a way to do that, uh, one popular way to do that with Leonia, for example, excuse me, for example, for example, with Leonia is at the start of the game to turn Isphus into a mage. So basically, since he's a master, Once he becomes a master monk, you can turn him into a mage and he retains all of his monk abilities. And then if you gain five levels of mage, then he becomes also an expert in mage. And then you can multi-class him to something else, which means that then he has all of the eels, he has the AoEs. And I'm not gonna do that because, again, that creates super units and that makes the game a little bit too easy for my taste. So I will not be doing that. Um, I will keep normal progression, which means that I'm going to keep Isfus as a monk. When, when he reaches level 20, he's going to become a guardian and that's it. Uh, for characters like Kilaf, for example, he's level 3. Uh, once I hit level 10, I'm gonna choose a path and I'm going to stick with it. I'm not going to be going back to turn him into a mage and give him like cool spells and everything. Uh, I don't... It's not necessarily cheating, but that's something the computer doesn't do, so I consider that as an unfair advantage. I don't like to do that, so I will not be doing uh, this. So that kind of concludes my little introduction video. Um, <clears throat> in the next video, <clears throat> excuse me, in the next video, we're going to go ahead and start for real. I'm going to be randomly selecting my first attack team. We're going to organize and probably do our first battle. So thank you for watching me. Uh, hopefully you're going to be in for the long run. Uh, I'm pretty excited to bring that game to you. Uh, it's pretty old, uh, but it's definitely one of my classics. And hopefully we can have fun uh, going through that together. So until next time.